Well, uh, good morning, uh, everyone, and welcome to our uh, webinar this morning. Um, it's early here in the UK. Uh, uh, my name is Simon Wright, and I'm uh, the host for today. Uh, with us online, we have uh, in uh, in Sweden, uh, Krista Fröling, who will be uh, presenting the first part of our webinar today. And uh, in Madrid, we have uh, Elena uh, Gheayo, um, uh as well. Uh, so uh, uh, we have a, a team of international presenters, and uh, we're looking forward to uh, your questions later on. Anyway, let's uh, let's begin. So um, I will do the introduction um, uh, to the company and the suite. Uh, then we will uh, look for uh, uh, Krista to look at uh, the uh, issue of requirements quality and procurement um, and how one gets a complete and consistent and correct set of bidding documents. Um, the demo will be handled by uh, uh, Elena. Questions will happen at the end. So uh, you have the chat box. Please, at any time, uh, type into the chat, chat box. Uh, address the comments to me, the reuse uh, company host. Uh, and then I will be putting the questions uh, to our presenters uh, when they have completed their presentations. So a little bit uh, about uh, uh, us, the reuse company. Um, uh, we are a worldwide company. Uh, we have partners uh, in France, Germany, T Italy, Spain, and Japan. Uh, customers throughout the, the world, UK, US, uh, Europe, Asia. Uh, as I said, we're headquartered in uh, Madrid, and that's where Elena is. Uh, I, am, I run the UK office here, uh, just north of London, and um, Krista is running the uh, Scandinavian office. Here are some of the companies that uh, are users of our uh, system. So what do we do? Well, we provide tools and solutions for what we call traceability, reuse, and quality management. Uh, and we do that by using semantic ana uh, analysis technologies. And these uh, technologies have been used in a very wide range of industries. Uh, we haven't yet found an industry that couldn't make use of these tools. Uh, our focus, as I said, is on traceability, reuse, and quality, and uh, we integrate uh, tools and technology uh, that we have with the way in which you do your work. Uh, we provide the uh, data that allows you to present uh, your quality analysis. Uh, we allow you to develop your knowledge bases so that you can most accurately assess the quality of your uh, specifications. And uh, reuse really says it all. We're talking, uh, that's our mission and vision, which is to reuse knowledge uh, which is within any organization. Uh, knowledge is probably the most valuable asset of any company. Um, and uh, we can offer processes, methods, tools, and services to help you build your research. Uh, that is the, uh, these are our tools, they're innovative, they're AI based, uh, and uh, we're having a lot of success helping people improve the quality of their documentation. Uh, we provide basically four tools. Uh, the first one we call Verification Studio. We used to call it the Requirement Quality Suite, but this is verifying requirements. This is the tool that uh, actually measures the quality of the specification. Uh, that assumes, of course, that we have a specification. And if we don't have a specification, we offer the tools uh, that allow uh, you to uh, actually author the uh, specifications, the requirements authoring tool. And of course, both of those work off a knowledge base. And so we have a knowledge manager that uh, allows you to populate the existing knowledge base with your domain-specific terms, uh, pa document patterns, etc. So that's uh, the three tools needed to develop specifications. Uh, of course, then the items within the specifications need to be traced, typically requirements to tests, but also there are many other trace links that need to be made. 
And our latest tool, the Traceability Studio, allows us to do that for you. So those are the tools that uh, are the basis of what we're going to be talking about today. And uh, so I will take this opportunity to pass back to um, uh, uh, Krista. Uh, excuse the, the sort of slight glitches, etc., in the presentation, um, because we're running over three sites. Uh, hopefully, uh, it'll be as smooth as possible. Krista. Okay. Uh, thank you, Simon. Uh, I would uh, just like to briefly introduce myself. My name is Christy Froehling. I'm running, as Simon said, from uh, the, the TRC Stockholm office. And I've been doing system development, system engineering, and procurement for basically all my life. Uh, and myself and my colleague Elena will describe and demonstrate what we call the procurement quality suite, or PQS. Uh, but really, let's start from the beginning. Uh, when it comes to public procurement, the value of, of products or the pro products like work products, goods, services that public bod bodies are doing across the European Union, for in this case, accounts for o over 14% of the total GDP. So it's a, it's a tremendous and massive amount of, of money floating around uh, out there, and it's it's this this is. The amount is so big, so it's, really, it's rather hard to, to get to grasp on. So uh, when, when, when we saw how uh, many organizations are, are doing their procurement, we, we realized that using, as Simon said, artificial intelligence, our tools, and a knowledge base will, will absolutely enable uh, organizations to be much, much more effective than they are today. Uh, so. There are many laws and regulations that that covers and, and man, manage uh, the public procurement, and, and this this picture is is uh, publicly available, uh, which shows how the EU members are following the uh, the governmental procurement agreement called the GP, GPA, which is part of the World Trade Organization's regulations for governmental procurement, uh, and. And really what we see when we see this picture is that most of us struggle, okay? Uh, we basically struggle with, with different things, but one, one thing that strikes me is, is the top row there, which describes uh, how well uh, the organizations uh, are specifying or how they are managing the specifications so that they, in this case, don't end up with just one bidder. And, and as you see, many of us, uh, can't really manage to know when we have specified enough. Uh, of course, it's it's very good that we have laws and regulations because we want to ensure transparency and competitiveness. That's what we would like to do. But over, specific, over specifying is or specifying a solution is is really a problem. Uh, and and also something that that we have realized that uh, we struggle with uh, or organizations struggle with is, is to have a, a notion of uh, how to evaluate and how you how you evaluate different priorities and needs so you don't just end up uh, procuring against the price or procuring against all the technical stuff so that you have a, a good set of balance so at the end of the day that you end up with uh, both technical fulfillment but also uh, the best value for money, uh, which means uh, to buy against a life cycle cost perspective. Uh, and, and that's not easy, as we will see. Uh, some some initial definitions that I would like to do is, is to differentiate between acquisition and uh, procurement. There is a difference, so just so you are aware. Uh, Acquisition is is quite straightforward. It's uh, you have a purchaser, which is also often the, the user of the goods on, and service, and they have a need. So they they turn to uh, one supplier. Of course, they can negotiate with with many one many suppliers, but many times they they have a, a supplier that can supply the, the goods and service. So that's what happens. But when we are talking about procurement, the public procurement, which is the bottom row there, uh, it's more complex. 
to, to the left, you have the user who has the need. And that's, that need needs to be expressed so that the organization doing the acquisition uh, really understands the, the, the need. So what they then do is that they transform that need following the rules, laws, and regulations uh, and publish a request, a request for information or a request for quotation or, or invitation to tender. It, it has many names uh, to a set of bidders out there. And they can be global uh, all over the world. So what needs to happen then is, is that the bidders, they are quoting, uh, evaluating the request, they're uh, answering back with the quote, and then the, the evaluation and negotiation and contracting take place. And after that, you can really say that you are doing an, an acquisition from one supplier. So it's a it's a very complex uh, motion going on here, and and the purchaser is is kind of a middleman here between the user and the bidder, and it it creates tremendous uh, uh, conflicts of of interest and, and uh, yeah problems altogether. So why do we need this procurement quality suite as we call it? Uh, yeah. We have realized that we need to have a process in place where we could uh, finding and, and agreeing on, on, on the semantics and the syntax and have a common language throughout the acquisition from the, from the uh, user to, to the supplier so that we, when we acquire goods, services or, or work that from an external source uh, through competitive bidding, we, we know that we, we, we can understand each other. And really what, what we see here is, is uh, well, basically three different um, concepts. First of all, you, have, you must have the system perspective in place, otherwise you can't procure the right type of solution to your need uh, from a technical perspective. So you need to be, be able to describe what you need. Then you have to, to have the, the business perspective so that you, you get the, uh, the best value for money and that you also fulfill the, the constraints and the procurement laws so you don't end up just having one bidder and one uh, and the things like that or, or breaking the, the laws. Uh, but one important aspect which perhaps is often forgotten is that you need to have the asset perspective as well, which means that you need to look at the the uh, the system or a product uh, you are acquiring uh, as an asset because you don't want to buy something which breaks down uh, after half a year and then it cost you tremendous amount of money. So you you want to be able to look at aspects like availability, life cycle cost as well. So it, it's really a complex thing which has been set in motion when you're doing a procurement. Uh, but when we, we look at the requirements from the requirements perspective, we, because we are using requirements to do, do uh, a procurement, that's, that's the, the motion here, is that poor requirements are in high odds of failure. And, and uh, this is a picture I often show when I talk about requirements and requirements quality. It's, uh, um, it's a study made by Dr. Gina Jolom joseph uh, where she studied 200 failed projects. With, with over $15 billion in sunken cost, which means that these projects were never delivered or they were not accepted. And of course, we see that that uh, projects which uh, run with bad project uh, requirements, they are often delayed, uh, and that delay often co also co uh, causes the projects to, to uh, fail altogether. But in the second place is changing or unclear requirements. And of course, I'm not saying that you have all the requirements set that, that, that at the start, you don't have all the answers, but you need to have a, a very good focus on having uh, the best requirements possible so that you have a low odds of failure, basically. So, and it, all, it comes all to semantics and syntax and being able to understand each other in this, in this chain, which I will show uh, later on. So, it's, it's quite so obvious that requirements are important. Uh, and another study, which is also of interest, is, is to, to look at uh, 
when are errors in those uh, systems which are delivered uh, introduced. And as we see in this study, which is not related to procurement but rather to system development, is that 70% uh, of the errors which are later found are actually introduced during the requirements phase. And when do we write requirements in the procurement? Well, we do them in the procurement phase, when we are doing the procurement. So it's, it's of vital importance that the team doing the procurement also know how to write good requirements. Otherwise, we will end up uh, misunderstanding each other and, and creating confusion. Uh, so we focus on requirements quality because it's, it's really the way that we communicate uh, through a procurement. And since communication in this case is done through, through humans, we need to understand that, that uh, we have a tendency of misunderstanding each other. Uh, and and this, this picture is taken from, from uh, neuro-linguistic programming principles, uh, where we're actually talking about uh, the inability of, of people understanding each other. And then we have things like uh, uh, that we generalize when we write requirements in this case. Cultural and language is, of course, of importance because uh, me as a, as a Swede, uh, I don't have the, the same language capability in English like my colleague Simon, for instance. So, of course, it, that, that can be of, of uh, an issue uh, when it comes to understanding each other. Uh, and why is understanding important? Yeah, important. Yeah, what we see really is that we we have a set of uh, transformations in information. We have a, we have what we call sender and receivers, where we actually have one party trying to describe something for another party, and and in this case we we have a procurement contract in in the middle, uh, doing that transformation of information and. If we are not doing the, the information, if we are not setting up the information in the procurement documentation in the correct way, we will end up having a user and a purchaser on one side and the bidders and the suppliers on the other side and, and they are constantly uh, misinterpreting each other because the contract itself or the procurement uh, documentation itself is not correct. Uh, and from a little bit more of an academic perspective, I want to show you this picture because it talks about completeness, consistency, and correctness, which is uh, the core of, of the reuse tool solution. Uh, we have to bear in mind that the goals of the requirements is to specify a product, service, or system uh, where we have two complementary point of view to define a good or bad requirement in this case. From the point of view of a sender, uh, the final quality of requirements uh, is to be able to to validate uh, that the, the receiving side, the information getting back is, is real of high quality so that I know uh, that that uh, the information I get, get back uh, is, is the correct one. So I need to be very good at knowing uh, am I describing the right things? Am I consistent in my language? Am I complete? Have I covered all the, the aspects which is needed? Uh, and, and of course, from the receiving side, we need to focus on understandability or, or in a broader sense, the correctness of the information so that we, we are able to, to uh, make sure that, that we have a, uh, information motion in place that, that allow us uh, to understand each other in the best of ways. So there's a lot of uh, things which probably Lena will talk about quality metrics because these things are integrated in the tools uh, will be used to enable us to, to check that we, we fulfill these, uh, these quality uh, issues. Uh, and if we don't, uh, I, I like to describe it as, well, the project death spiral. Uh, we end up having a user, uh, and the user is probably not very aware of how to write requirements or how to express themselves. Uh, they probably have a, a solution in mind already, or they know the system they have, which needs to be replaced. So often the information coming from the user or the stakeholder, as we can call them, are, are not that clear. So the purchaser in this case needs to be very good at in, interpreting that into 
a set of complete, consistent and correct requirements. And if that's not done, well, you see for yourself, uh, because what we can add in this picture is also the procurement contract. If we develop this into an incom incomplete, inconsistent and incorrect set of requirements or procurement documents, we will have for sure uh, set the, in place the motion of, of <laughs> this death spiral because how can the bidders understand what I really mean if I can't express myself in a good way? So I will end up uh, having a contract in place uh, making almost sure that I will end up with the wrong solution and end up having uh, unhappy users or stakeholders. So what I also can add in this picture is, is really that you have an internal uh, line as well. Uh, if we talk about senders and receivers, uh, we also have it between the user and the purchaser because I, I need to understand my users and be able to prepare the procurement documentation in, in the best of ways. So from a life cycle perspective, what we see really is, is that the procurement project is really a short thing from the life cycle perspective. In this case, I'll, I'll just choose the train. Um, so after the procurement project, I need to, uh, to transit or deliver over the, the product, in this case, the train uh, to the users. And, and I have to make sure in the procurement project that uh, the life cycle cost and the availability uh, is in line with the needs uh, so, so that I also cater, as I said before, for the availability part. I don't want to have systems that break, break down all the time, uh, probably. Uh, and I don't want to have a low procurement cost and a very high life cycle cost, uh, probably, as well. Uh, so I need to be able to balance these three perspectives where the technical uh, side with all the functionality and capabilities are, are not really the complete picture. So it's, it's quite complex. So how, how well do we manage these things today? Well, I would say not very good because if, if I just, just Google at, at bad procurement, I get 48 million hits uh, and it's very easy to, to see that, well, organizations are struggling out there because it's not easy. And just some brief examples. Uh, this is a French example where they unfortunately bought uh, trains that wa was too wide for the platforms. Uh, not a very good situation. Another situation, sorry for this, but this is, this is Swedish, but it's very recent where actually the procurement agency uh, that bought in this case uh, control system for a subway. They did not. They say they stated that they didn't uh, receive the functionality they have claimed, and they want to get compensation. So they end up in court. Uh, and well, I would like to look at those requirements because I think you could do. You could have done something there. Uh, and this, the last thing is, well, uh, also the military, of course, struggles. The military often have very complex systems, long, long life cycles, and, and this is a Canadian example. So there are uh, many examples out there if you would like to, to look at those. Um, and the result from, from writing bad uh, procurement documentation is, is, is really a matrix of bad things that can happen. Of course, you can end up having lawsuits or, or appeals uh, uh, from bidders that, that didn't win, that didn't get to, the, to be the supplier, or you end up having the wrong product, or you just end up having uh, unhappy uh, stakeholders or users because you deliver something which they don't really need it. Uh, and just to, to mention something, uh, this is a Swedish figure, but it's, it's not different from the, the European uh, figures at all. 8% uh, of all the public procurement in Sweden were appealed, uh, and it meant that you, in average, spent seven months in delays in those uh, 4,190 projects, and that's a lot of effort and money uh, basically down the drain. And I'm not going to do it, to explain this picture in, in great detail, but um, as we can see, uh, it, it is a quite complex task to 
as the purchaser to manage the user perspective and be able to transform it to a supplier so that you end up having a procurement project which runs smoothly so that you can hand over at the end of the day a system or a, a, a work product which is really accepted and, and of high use uh, with high availability, low life cycle cost uh, to the user. Um, and if we look at, at the people that, that are involved in, in developing uh, the procurement documents, uh, we will take, later take a look at, at exa uh, some examples uh, of, of the procurement documents. The, the roles uh, which are typically involved are, are as you see, uh, many different ones. It's, of course, the engineers, they need to, to understand and describe uh, the technical part, the technical requirements. Uh, they also need to understand uh, the system it's, it's going to be integrated somewhere, like the train example here, where we need, have needed to understand that the train needs to fit the platforms. Uh, that's an interface issue. And also we have, of course, the purchase describing all the commercial requirements and then setting up the, the schema that, that you, which, which make it uh, possible for you to to do the purchase and then do the procurement project in the first place. And then you have probably a project manager that describes uh, the need uh, which needs to be handled in the, uh, the procurement project, in the delivery part of it. And, and it, this is all surrounded by, by the framework, which is probably governed by, by the lawyer or perhaps the purchasing organization, it's making sure that you are doing uh, a, a bidding process according to laws and regulations. So it's just a complete set of information which need to be complete and consistent and correct. And when we look at correct, complete and consistent, when it comes to a, a set of, of tendering or bidding documents, it's, it's probably a lot of documents. Uh, this is uh, one example. I, I'm sure that you, you have your, your own set of, of uh, documents, but it's more than one, I should say. Uh, and Please bear in mind that the information in the separate documents, of course, needs to be correct. But when it comes to comparing the documents, the document set itself should show the complete picture. So uh, it's very often that we find inconsistency and incompleteness uh, and basically incorrectness when it comes to comparing different documents, like comparing the information uh, invitation to tender with evaluation criteria, uh, with the project requirements in perhaps a, a document called the statement of work, or all the technical specifications themselves. They are often inconsistent when you cross-read them. And typically what happens is uh, that uh, these documents are developed in parallel and, and rather in isolation. So you don't have the time to, to do this checking. And what we can make sure is that you can cross cross check these information sets. And, and Elena will uh, explain that uh, later on. So that's one of the greater benefits of, of the procurement quality suite. But just to explain uh, briefly uh, the CCC approach, um, it's, it's uh, except from the knowledge base, the knowledge manager, uh, it's it's the heart of, of the driver of, of these tools, it, and it makes sure that the individual requirements they are are correct, uh, both when it comes to semantics and syntax, uh, and of course the the important thing of being knowing when you're done, when you are complete, uh, and knowing that you are free of inconsistency. Uh, that's that's really what what we are looking for and aiming for. We have used. Uh, for as a foundation, have we used uh, the guide to write requirements from Incosa, and it, it has to be tailored, and we have tailored it to to suit the need for procurement in this case. Uh, and when we start to look at the suite itself, uh, we'll soon hand over to Elena to do a demonstration. Uh, the application itself. Uh, 
is built around the knowledge base because the knowledge is built up over time and it's a tremendous amount of knowledge in the organizations doing the procurement altogether. So why start over again? Why don't reuse the information so that one procurement project can learn from its mistakes and the next procurement project can, can do it better? And that's, that's also one of the, the great things of, of being knowledge driven because many times uh, a procurement project basically starts that like this, with a blank sheet of paper, uh, starting the right requirements, uh, using the best abilities you can, the system shall blah, 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 do something. Uh, so we thought, well, well we, we will set up a set of, of uh, templates. And this is the te technical template following uh, standard uh, ISO 29148 for a technical system. So we have, used, do, we have done that throughout. So uh, the procurement quality suite itself is, is in the middle. You have the tools, you have the knowledge base, uh, where, we're, uh, where we're put in structures, quality rules, uh, patterns, which Elena will talk about, and standards, which also Elena will show. And we have developed a set of uh, templates for the technical specification, the project specification, the statement of work, for support, or now we call it contract logistic support, but the, the support specification. Uh, we have created a set of compliance response sheets to, to manage uh, the, how you get uh, hand in the, the response as a bidder. And we also have looked at lifecycle cost and price and the bidder evaluation. And not to forget that we have started to, to uh, develop an inline procurement method guidebook. So in this, this first release, I would say, is that we, we have the tool suite itself, which uh, Simon explained, the knowledge base uh, with standards and rules implemented, with patterns, which Elena will talk more about, with metrics assigned for procurement, the handbook, some templates, and, and some things that we are looking for the future. And here I would like to invite uh, all of you listening to, to participate really and, and give us information. What do you need? Because there's a lot of things that can be done using these tools. But what we have done is really that we have set up uh, a process in place. And I know that I'm uh, basically running out of time here, so I will not explain this in greater details, but we, we have focused on the asset perspective, as I said. Uh, procuring an, an asset uh, using a, the procurement uh, schema to do so. Uh, and to be able to, to manage this, we have created, as we said, as I've been saying, a set of uh, integrated uh, templates uh, so, so that you know what type of requirements to write, and what type of aspects to cover, so that you, you uh, get uh, the best possibilities to be, be both complete, correct, and consistent. And if we look a little bit more into that green box called bit evaluation, bit management and evaluation. Uh, yeah, okay, sorry. Uh, I should also say here that, uh, that the quality metrics themselves uh, are set up with different baselines so that you can increase uh, the need for quality from the initial study phase through actual the, the acquisition phase itself when you go into contracting so that you ensure that you are constantly increasing the quality of the information. Uh, and Elena will talk more about the quality metrics we have set up. But if we look at bid management and evaluation, uh, here is really the, it, it's quite standardized procurement uh, process which, which follows the EU rules. Um, but what we have set in place, as I said, is, is a set of specification. Uh, the SIRS is the technical specification based on, on that ISO process. Uh, the statement of work, the project uh, requirements, uh, the support requirements in the CLS, contractual logistic support. And we have also looked at implementing other assets which may, may be of interest, but we have started with the, these three things. And one thing which, which can be separately mentioned is that the STD or system design uh, document is, is, is really something we, we can look into. Is say, for instance, that you have uh, 
uh, operational concept documents with drawings showing how the system are, are supposed to be used that can be integrated so that we can check consistency and uh, completeness against the drawings and models against the requirements. Uh, but we haven't started there now. Um, so by saying that, I would like to hand over to Elena uh, that will uh, take us through a demonstration. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Krista. Uh, so we're now moving uh, from Krista in Stockholm to uh, Elena in uh, Madrid. And so we're going to just change who the presenter is. Uh, so uh, the, your screen will go blank for a moment and then come straight up with uh, Elena. So uh, Elena, um, uh, I hope you're ready to go and uh, please uh, give us the demonstration of the procurement quality suite. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, thank you very much, Christer, for this conceptual introduction you've done to, to the application. Um, let's put now some practical demonstration on, on top of some of the trickiest activities when managing requirements in a procurement project. Uh, first, um, let me introduce myself. My name, sorry, my name is Elena Gallego, and I'm the consulting director at the Reuse Company. So my main role or, or purpose in the projects that we done, that we do in at the Reuse Company is to to find the the proper application of our solution to to our customer needs. Um, certainly, a procurement project uh, has at least two different viewpoints. Uh, the acquirer perspective and the supplier viewpoint. Yet the project has a common purpose, which is to establish an agreement between between the two parties. Then uh, the supplier will ensure to supply a product or service, and then in accordance with the with acquirer's requirements. So, uh, for the demo, um, we will take the role of the supplier. Uh, although some of the activities will be common for both sides. Um, we will we will demo the an application or an activity for the four different tools that Simon has introduced before. So I want to go back to this, but at least I want you to to remember that for for managing a complex project such as such as this procurement project, it is needed to handle at least the four main pillars for the systems engineering processes or activities as we could call these procurement projects within the agreement processes in, in the system in, in, in activities. So, um, as I was saying before for the demo, we will take the role of the supplier. Um, so we have identified four main activities in the requirements definition stage that will somehow show which are the main relationships within the requirements definition activities and how can we apply all the concepts that Christer has introduced before. So the first step usually is that the, either we are a supplier or, or an, um, a purchaser agency as Christer also was defining before um, in the definition between the, the different the, for the differences between the acquisition and procurement process, we will receive a document. That's usually the, the first input that we will have. That it's usually came in the, in the shape or format of a PDF or a Word document. So the first action would be to, to extract that information, those requirements that we will use for as a supplier to ensure that we are going to provide the product in accordance with acquires requirement and we will extract that information into our requirements management systems that can be a, a doors database or excel document or even a word document sometimes for and then we will check the whether those requirements are compliant with the the regulations and laws with different standards applicable to for safety or for the statement of works, the technical specifications and some other aspects that we will mention um, late, later on. But also it is important to, to check that information for us as a suppliers, but also it's something relevant from the acquired point of view. Since 
we can ensure then that we are covering all the aspects that we have to to handle in our contracts. Then the next step would be to check how are we performing from the from the supplier perspective again it is important to to check whether all the requirements that we have extracted and the new ones that we have been added into our specifications are really compliant compliance with the standards in the procurement project but also with the original information that we had in the in that original pdf or word document and the last step that we will show during the demonstration is to 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 close the loop to to keep tracing all the information back to the source it is really important in the moment that we start doing some modifications or adding new information on top of the original contract or agreement that we that everything have a relationship to the source information there is no requirement that is just there and is not related to any original requirement in the document so we need to to trace all the information back to the source and ensure that for the whole life cycle of the requirements document so let's go then for the first step the automatic requirement solicitation from documents as we were saying before we will receive some unstructured documents that can be either word or pdf unstructured or with unstructured we mean that it's information that has not the shape of a table that has not uh, attributes or information in there it's just natural language um, represented in the shape of paragraphs or it might have tables but it's not an organized source of information then what we will do is to to do an automatic extraction based on patterns on patterns that will represent uh, more complex or simple structures to index that information so we can define how accurate do we want to be also sometimes we we will not be able to be as accurate as we'd like to so we need to have the different levels of abstraction or complexity to extract that information and put that into our requirements documents or, or databases. So let's see a demo about that. In this case, what we are going to do is for a procurement project in, a, in the railway domain, we have uh, the system requirement specification received by the acquirer, in this case, by the purchaser agency where they represent the, the basic set of requirements that they wanted to have with a list of terms definitions and other elements that need to be handled and kept along the whole project so now we are going to connect to the, our rich authoring tool to an empty database in excel in this case we are selecting now this word document and also the patterns that we want to apply to extract the requirements that are contained in that document automatically. In this case, we have select a rather specific set of patterns. So the results shown that only 10 requirements out of that document complies with those patterns that we've selected. This is to a more or a deeper extraction of information from there but we can do a lighter one where we are more laxed in the information that we want to find. And that's why now the results show that we have much more requirements in that document if we just look for a, a higher or higher level of abstraction of information. The next step would be to check whether those extracted requirements are compliant with the main standards applicable to the procurement projects. For doing so, we have identified three main elements up to now that are the most representative to, in terms of compliance or to check the compliance. The statement of work, where, and for, for this we have extracted uh, or modeled the standard from the, the DOD, where it defines all the basic information that should be covered in any single statement of work. Also, we have extracted some other information for the defense, for technical specifications. The same for the support part, 
for CLS or contractor logistic support or integrated logistic support, depending whether we are talking about civil or military projects. Another relevant standard that needs to be modeled or compliant with is the work burden structure for the statement of work mainly, and also the technical specifications. The, for in this case, it is very important to 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 have during the whole life cycle of the requirements document, or even during the project, to ensure that our requirements are correct, complete, and consistent, as Christer was introducing before, just to to comply with the the regulations that will measure how well defined is our is our product or service in any case. So what we've done is to model all these standards with our knowledge manager tool in order to to take all the information from terminology patterns and model that in the shape of different set of or of knowledge bases or libraries that will represent this information including the patterns so we can plug and play the information so we can say that in this moment or at this point we are only looking at technical specifications so we just upload the technical library or we upload the statement of work library depending on which topic are we working with or either we can have all of them all together as we have in this example but the idea is not only to to model the knowledge from standards in here but also the knowledge from our system the different system elements, components that we have for our solution with all the properties that are related to those elements and also the relationships or architectures that we have for our product as, as it is shown in this product breakdown structure that we have in here. Then once we have both the knowledge from our system and the knowledge from our standards modeling our ontology or knowledge base, it is the moment to check whether our requirements are compliance in terms of completeness and consistency to most of the standards, at least to those representing the documents themselves, like the statement of work or the support documents, and also the correctness, completeness and consistency for the technical specifications. In this case, we have split it into two different areas because the technical specifications are more relevant to be analyzed from the correctness point of view rather than the other the other areas that we have. So the idea is to check then the the performance of our specifications in terms of the quality metrics. For doing so, we have modeled a set of different metrics from the three different viewpoints, completeness, consistency, and correctness, and also from the, the supplier and the acquirer point of view. Because for the acquirer, it, will be, it might be much more relevant to, to make an automatic evaluation of the different uh, candidate of uh, supply the, the product documents and also for the supplier viewpoint, it will be much more important to know whether they are really uh, complying with the regulations and the standards and the requirements that have been defined by the acquired company or organization. And then another important aspect is within that process of developing requirements, modifying them and evolving the specifications in the end, it is important to know whether we have overly specified our specifications or not. This is very important then to make an overlapping analysis so we can check whether there are inconsistent information from the source documents to what we have right now in our in our requirements database. So let's check then how do we do that in our in our solution, in this case, we have the verification studio that is checking how the quality has been evolving since we started the project. In here, we have modified requirements. We have added new requirements. That's why we see the, that increase on the, on the quality. It might be low quality or high quality. In the end, what we want to ensure is that we are for each requirement that we have in our databases, we are fulfilling with the correctness uh, rules, as we see here, the consistency and the completeness rules. 
And it's also important that for the consistency and completeness mainly, we don't only check the the rules against the law and the regulation or standards, but also we will check consistency issues within the system as well. In the moment that we start developing the information, we need to check whether our system properties are consistent among the bunch of requirements that we have in our documents. Also, as we were saying before, it is very important to know at any and at any point whether our requirements are overlapped or not from the with the original information. In this case, on the left hand side we have our extracted requirement from the original document and we have another one uh, that we have developed for in for our product and we see that there is a, even though they are written in completely different ways, they have a hundred percent of similarity because they were talking about the same sort of property. But in that case, uh, even though it was quite quick, they were talking for different um, measurement unit systems. One was in the metric system and international system. Then to go to the last part of the of the presentation and also for the or the demonstration, um, we highlighted at the beginning that it's important to keep tracing all the information back to the source from the documents and the um, and the requirements database. That's why in here we have connected on the left hand side, we have our original information or original set of documents. And in the right hand side, we have the current specification or requirements document. What we've done now is to automatically suggest all the traces that should exist among the different requirements based on the product brain and structure. For the example, we have decided that every system element or component that are related within the system architectures should be linked between each other because uh, they represent some similarities. But what happened then if we decide to modify or afterwards we modify any of the requirements that we have in our working specification? In this case, let's do just a very simple modification. Let's change the, the units and transform from watts to kilowatts. And let's see how the system then will, will highlight that the traces that we have created beforehand are no longer valid, at least should be evaluated because they are suspect as we have changed the text containing in that requirement. It is very important at any point that for sure we need to trace the information, but we need to trace it wisely. And we need to, to bear in mind that in the moment that we make a modification in a requirement, we need to measure the impact that that modification has with the original sort of information. In the moment that we know the impact, we can decide to, okay, we accept this suspect and it is fine there is no issue anymore and, and we can proceed as as we've been done before. This was the last part of the demonstration. With this, we close the loop. We have extracted the requirements. We have checked the compliance against the standards. We have measured the quality for the original set of requirements and also for the um, evolved requirements. And we have traced all that information back to the source to at any point in the project. So this was everything that I wanted to show. Uh, I will now then hand over the the, the control to, to Christer. So I think now... Thank you, Elena. To... Yes, uh, we're passing it across to Christer. Christer will bring up his presentation uh, very quickly. Um, thank you very much, uh, Elena, for that uh, presentation. Uh, I don't know about uh, anybody else, but uh, I found it uh, uh, very detailed um, and uh, uh, I'm looking forward to uh, receiving the uh, link to the recorded uh, webinar. We record all our webinars and if uh, you want to refresh or go back to your, um, uh, uh, go back and review what was said and what was shown, um, then uh, when you get the recording, you'll be able to do that. I'm looking forward to that because I need to go back through that um, 
I think we've only got to say now is uh, our thank yous. Um, thank you for everyone who uh, has uh, logged in. Thank you uh, for Krista. Thank you, uh, Elena, for your presentations. Um, and uh, uh, it, now is the opportunity for you to uh, uh, ask any questions. So uh, in the chat uh, box, you will have to click on the chat icon to bring it up on the top uh, right-hand part of your screen. Um, and if you have any questions, then uh, uh, please, if you could ask them now. Um, and uh, uh, we will deal with your uh, questions uh, as they come through. So um, whilst you're doing that, uh, I'll tell you briefly about our next uh, webinar. And uh, Elena, have you given me control? Yes. Thank you. So the next webinar, uh, the smarter way to improve your requirement specifications. Uh, we've talked a lot about uh, requirements, uh, requirement specifications, um, and we've seen uh, all the tools working together. But uh, this particular um, uh, webinar will look just at the uh, process of writing requirements. Um, and looking first of all at the sources of problems and misunderstandings. Um, and uh, we'll teach a number of uh, tools, uh, sorry, tricks and techniques to overcome the problems uh, to give you that error free requirement specification that we're looking for. Uh, so it's going to cover in detail, uh, first of all, the rich authoring tool. Now, this is the tool, if you haven't got any requirements uh, and you don't know how to write requirements, this is the tool that's going to help you. And then we'll look at the verification studio, which then having got the written requirements uh, will allow us to uh, measure the quality. So that is our next uh, webinar. So we have some uh, uh, questions. And first of all, Krista, if you can make sure you're unmuted, because the first couple uh, seem to come basically, I think, for your part. I apologize if I haven't allocated the questions to the right people, but anyway. Uh, the first question to you, Krista. Uh, uh, you stated that the requirements must be correct, complete, and consistent, but how can we know what requirements to write in the first place? Oh, I think I've almost answered that one. Anyway, <laughs> sorry yeah, about no, that. Okay. Yeah, Krista. no, no, no. It's, it's, it's a very good question. Of, of, course, uh, of course, these tools, uh, when we have built up the knowledge, will help you and guide you into the specific parts and then the sections and, and what to cover. But at the end of the day, it's, it's, uh, you have to have a sound system engineering approach and you have to have skilled people. So these tools can guide you and, and the, the templates will, will help you. But uh, at the end, in the end of the day, uh, you need to be a collaboration between the tools and the people doing the, the, the engineering work itself. Thank you. Uh, yes. So. Uh, uh, obviously, um, uh, very fortuitous, but uh, yes, uh, our next webinar will, will look at this precise issue. Mm, uh, second yeah. one I'm going to allocate to you, Krista. Um, okay. How long does it take to implement a PQS in an organization? Ah, okay. Uh, I, I, actually, I think that, that you, Elena, would, would be good at explaining uh, how we do uh, proof of concept projects. Yeah. Okay, yeah, good. Yeah. Elena. Yeah. Yeah, well, it it will depend. It's rather difficult to say uh, a time because it depends very much on the maturity of the organization. But as Krista was saying, what we usually do is a proof of concept where in what we try first to evaluate whether this might be useful or not and if it's suitable with the organization's processes. Usually it takes up to three months where we just work together and develop some some use case together just to see how how does it fit or not in in your processes so i'd say i, I wouldn't risk to say a, a period of time for how much does it take to implement the whole pqs but at least i would say that in 3 months or even a little bit less you can you can see whether it will fit or not and then you can make an estimation on, on the efforts that it would bring. 
Great. Thank you, Elena. Um, I think this one also now, uh, back to Krista. Um, uh, the question is, how does the solution work from the acquirer side where they don't evolve the requirements but are more focused on the evaluation of the information provided by the bidders? Now, that, that's quite interesting. I've worked on projects where, yeah. where the, the procurer uh, just says, look, I, I need a widget. It uh, doesn't really know really what they want, but uh, then uh, receive back bidder information and then they need to evaluate it. Can you speak to that? Yeah, but uh, I, I would say, Simon, that, that you have the best of knowledge on, on that one because you have been working on such projects, haven't you? Well, okay, thank you. I will. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, very interesting. Uh, the thing to do uh, with that is if you're trying to evaluate the information provided by the bidders, uh, particularly the technical information, uh, you've got to look at maturity. In other words, uh, if somebody's trying to sell you the widget, uh, you've got to then decide, well, um, should the widget be fast and blue? Mm. Uh, you then need to ask the, the supplier, okay, have you tested that the, uh, the product you know, remains blue throughout the whole of its lifetime? And yeah. if, uh, if they have, uh, and they can provide evidence for it. So uh, I think this is uh, similarly if it's fast. So you say, yeah. well, could you please define the, the speed at which your system operates? And has, again, that been tested? Because um, mm. to evaluate the information from the bidders, uh, I've used technical uh, readiness levels. In other words, yeah. uh, a bidder will say, yeah, this is the most wonderful widget in the world uh, mm. and give you all the, uh, uh, give you uh, hopefully valid information. But the way to see if this is a valid uh, piece of information or a promise for future development, I've used technical readiness levels and I find that they are really uh, useful in being able to uh, evaluate the maturity of the information provided by the bidders. Yeah, and, and I, I, <clears throat> I will also add that we, we have also looked at capability maturity where you uh, ah. assess the, the ability for the supplier to actually deliver something uh, or how is the maturity of the organization itself. So it, it's up to creating good metrics, really. Uh, uh, yeah, absolutely, yes. So the capability, maturity measurements are, are equally useful. Yeah. So uh, I think a uh, final question here I've got for Elena. Um, is it possible to handle multilingual projects? It's very common to have uh, information in different languages, for example, French and English. Yeah. Um... Sure, it's possible. We support with the with the systems engineering studio. We support uh, different languages like English, French, German, Japanese, Italian, and Swedish. So we have a module which can make transformations among the different among the different languages. So you could, for instance, receive a document in one language, then process the information with some patterns, you have a specific library for doing so to make a transformation. In this case, you were saying French and English, then you will have a, a library for doing that sort of transformations. And then you will, you will link or work together with both languages without any, any issue. Thank you. Uh, we don't have any more uh, questions and we don't have any more time. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to finally thank Krista and Elena for their presentation. I'd like to thank, thank all you. those who have uh, participated in this call. And uh, uh, I hope that you will receive the, the links to the recordings if you want to review the information again. And I look forward to uh, speaking with you all again in the near future. So thank you very much. This is now the end of the uh, meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you.